Thanks so much for hanging with us to the bitter end. We were a little discouraged at one point seeing all the people trickling away here after the last <laughs> session. So thanks for coming in. Uh, this project that Rick and I were involved with is part of this larger project uh, headed up by Pete Hill and some of our other partners in crime here. Four different research teams who had the mission of developing some standard measures of humility and of intellectual humility for more widespread use. So we have research teams, and then we have some consultants, both psychologists and philosophers, with whom we've met to work on these projects over the last couple of years. Along the way, the group worked very hard to come up with some kind of a consensus conceptualization of what intellectual humility is. And this is the conceptualization that we settled on. That intellectual humility is recognizing that a particular personal belief, attitude, or position is fallible, accompanied by appropriate attentiveness to limitations and the evidentiary basis of that belief and to one's own limitations in obtaining and evaluating evidence relevant to it. And you can see there were philosophers involved in helping to craft that <laughs> definition. And you can see this is, this is really a variant of the owning one's limitations approach uh, that Heather and Dan have been talking about at this meeting. It includes, though, not just your own limitations, but being very attentive to the quality of the evidence that is informing your beliefs is part of this as well. So we had two goals. One is to develop a general measure of intellectual humility, the general tendency to be humble or arrogant, and then also to, me to develop measures of intellectual humility in specific contexts according to this definition. So I'm going to talk about the general measure, and then Rick's going to talk about the domain-specific measure. So our first goal was to develop a measure that would capture the basic elements of this conceptualization. We wanted it to be as brief as possible. We wanted it to be unidimensional. Now, I know there's a lot of measures being developed for intellectual humility that have multiple factors, and that's fine. What we were concerned about for our own purposes is we wanted to get something that we thought measured the core of intellectual humility as conceptualized in this way so that we could distinguish the core features from any correlates or manifestations or downstream consequences. And that's more difficult when you have a multi-dimensional multi scale. We also were concerned, other times when I developed multi-dimensional scales, if you combine across the different factors, you find that different individuals can score exactly the same score for very different reasons, because they're high versus low on a number of separate things. So we wanted this to be brief and unidimensional. <laughs> and although that sounds like an easy thing, we spent a year, I have, we've never been so frustrated in our lives, trying to come up with items that captured this in a way that met psychometric properties that we needed to fulfill, and that distinguished intellectual humility from other constructs with which it's closely related, like dogmatism in particular. But we finally did. We literally went through five or six iterations where we would minister a number of items to a large sample, we'd analyze them, we'd look at the data, throw those, <laughs> throw those items out, start over again, get some others, rewrite them. Finally came up, though, with a six-item scale that seemed to capture the basic elements of what we regard as a general tendency toward intellectual humility. And I'll just let you sort of scan through those. These are all things that an intellectually humble person at the core ought to be able to endorse at a high level. And an intellectually arrogant person would not. Now, for those of you interested in the psychometrics of this, it does seem to be unidimensional. Confirmatory factor analysis says so, so it's reliable. And we're also always concerned about social desirability biases when you use self-report measures. There is no social desirability bias here. So it's not contaminated by people's tendency to want to be perceived in a positive way. So what I want to do is very briefly, in a whirlwind kind of way, take you through four studies very quickly to give you just a sense of what we're finding about the psychological characteristics of people who score low versus high on intellectual humility as conceptualized and operationalized in this particular way. So the first data we collected was to look at personality correlates of intellectual humility. And here are some of the, some of the basic findings. People higher in, in general intellectual humility are higher in openness to experience, which you would expect. Correlations about the right magnitude. Of course, openness to experience is more than just openness to ideas. It's openness to new foods and new music and new experiences in general. So that is something we would certainly expect. They're also higher in need for cognition. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that concept, it's a horrible, horrible label 
for what that trait really is. Need for cognition reflects the degree to which a person enjoys thinking and thinks a lot. The people in this room are outliers on the high end of need for cognition. What we had assumed is that being someone who enjoys thinking and thinking a lot, that ought to make it easier for an individual to be high in intellectual humility because the more you think about something, the more nuanced view you have, and you realize it's not just black or white. If you're someone who doesn't like to think about things in much detail, it's easier to cling to the idea that my view is right and it's a pretty clear-cut matter. People high in intellectual humility also have a higher tolerance for ambiguity. When you tolerate ambiguity, you can sort of suspend judgment on things. You can say, I don't know, and I don't need to know. People low in tolerance for ambiguity want answers, they want them now, and once they have an answer, they're very resistant to change it because that opens up the whole question again of, well, what's the right answer to this particular issue? Being higher in tolerance for ambiguity also ought to be the kind of trait that makes it easier to be intellectually humble. We'd assume that people high in intellectual humility, well, might also be higher in curiosity, which they are, administering the epistemic curiosity scale. There are two subscales on that measure. One that measures the degree to which people are curious because they're inherently interested in things. They just get a kick out of learning. They're fascinated by stuff. There are also individuals who are curious because they feel unsettled when they don't fully understand things. They want to learn more about the world, not because of the enjoyment of learning, but because they're unsettled by not feeling like they really understand things. In both cases, more curious individuals tend to be higher in intellectual humility. Lower in self-righteousness, pretty much conceptualized the way you just normally in lay people's language think about self-righteousness. Lower in dogmatism, which we would expect. There are two correlations there because we had two measures, Rokic's classical measure and Altmaier's more recent measure. If you look at Altmaier's measure, I mean, it's a little, tr was initially troubling to us, 0.49 was bigger than what we would have liked for our scale, but if you look at his measure, a lot of the items look a lot more like intellectual humility than they look like dogmatism. So in fact, maybe there already exists an intellectual humility out measure out there in the literature hiding within Altmaier's items. And there's a tendency for people in higher intellectual humility to be more agreeable. Or maybe better said, people who are not high in intellectual humility tend to be more disagreeable. So we have other personality data, but it begins to give a picture of what the intellectually humble person might be like. It also provides construct validity for the scale, these kinds of correlations that one would expect if, in fact, we're measuring intellectual humility the way that we conceptualize it. So with those data assuring us that the scale is working reasonably well, we did a few, a few studies. In the first one, we were interested in how people high and low in intellectual humility react to those who have different viewpoints. So we had Qualtrics panel recruit a national sample for us. And we had them do it because we wanted the widest possible variability in religiosity, from completely non-religious, atheistic people to very religious individuals. So 188 participants pre-tested them in intellectual humility and re religiosity. And it's conceptualized by that religiosity scale. This has to do with how important is religion to you? How much time do you spend in formal worship settings? How much time do you spend in private religious practice and reading and prayer and meditation? How much do you say you want religion to infuse your life? Then we randomly assigned them to read an essay that was either explicitly anti-religious here are all of the bad things that religion does. It creates divisions among people. It tells people things that they're supposed to be true, but in fact they're just myths. All kinds of negative stuff that atheists would say about religion. A pro-religion essay, here are all the good things that religion does for people. Or a balanced essay that had both the anti and the pro-religion arguments in it. And then we had participants rate the essay. How much do you agree with it? Is it correct? Rate the writer. And they also rated their emotions after having read the essay. First important thing is that intellectual humility was not correlated with either religiosity scores or beliefs about whether religion's effects are positive or negative. Now, I know it's easy to have stereotypes about people varying in religiosity and whether they might be more intellectually arrogant or humble, but we were absolutely delighted that, in fact, religious ideology is not correlated with intellectual humility. You can have arrogant fundamentalists and you can have arrogant atheists. But 
Intellectual humility was correlated negatively with the belief that one's views about religion are correct, which it should be. More intellectually humble people said that they were less certain that their views, whatever they happened to be, were correct. We also found that people high in intellectual humility reported the highest positive affect of all groups in all conditions when they had read the balanced essay. Which I found, you know, just I, we didn't expect that, but that's kind of interesting. Somebody with an open approach to knowledge feel better, just in a general emotional way, after reading balanced arguments. I think an intellectually humble person is put off when they're only given one point of view, because they know the picture's bigger than that, and they'd like to have, have full details. The next slide I'm going to show you, you're not, you're not, you're not going to be able to see or read, and, but I want to put three slides up at once, three graphs, and then I'll point out what I want you to focus on after I do that. All right. These are ratings of the person who wrote the essay. Ratings of competence, I think there's three items. How competent, intelligent, and informed, how ethical, honest, and moral, and how warm, friendly, and agreeable, or I think it was. And we have across the x-axis, this is intellectual humility from very low to very high, and then the ratings of competence. The three lines are the three different essay conditions. So I want to point out two features of these graphs, which you can see are pretty comparable in terms of their form. First thing I want to point out is, at levels of low intellectual humility, the ratings of the essay writer are more strongly affected by the content of the essay. Whereas at high levels of intellectual humility, the ratings of the essay writer, in these two cases, they're not even significantly different. Down here it is, and I'll come back to that in a minute. For high intellectually humble people, they did not, their ratings of the essay writer were not as strongly influenced by the content of the essay as the individuals who were low in intellectual humility. Judgments of other people, for high intellectually humble people, their judgments of others are not as affected or as infused by the beliefs of the other people. Other thing I want to point out is, is this lower line that's upward sloping to the right. That's the anti-religion essay condition. For the other two conditions, the pro-religion and the balanced, these, there's, these slopes are not significant. It didn't matter whether people were low or high in intellectual humility, they rated the essay writer the same. But for the anti-religion essay, low intellectually humble people really dumped on them, but then their judgments moderated when they were high in intellectual humility. This difference here, this exclusively anti-religion essay condition. When you read that essay, it does come across as pretty surly. I mean, if somebody just says negative thing after negative thing after negative thing about religion, you can sort of see why everybody would say, well, that, that's not a very warm and friendly person to say all that much nasty stuff. I think the reason why we're getting the, the moderating effect of intellectual humility on ratings of the essay writer only in the anti-religion essay condition, if you look at our participants' judgments of the degree to which they agree with these essays, most of our participants, even the non-religious ones, moderately agreed with the positive and the balanced essay. Because even very non-religious people say, I don't believe this stuff, but I, you know, religion's probably okay, basically. But most of the sample did not agree with the extremely negative tone of that anti-religion essay. And I think that created a, a hurdle for non-intellectually humble people to get over. They just really reacted ne negatively to that, and it affected their view of the essay writer. But the ones who were higher in intellectual humility were able to separate the disagreeable message from the messenger and the essay writer. Another study we did looked at people's reactions to those who change their positions. The thinking here was an intellectually humble person says, by definition, I'm willing to change my mind when I get new evidence. That suggests that an intellectually humble person ought to be more open to other people changing their mind. So in this study, we pre-tested participants for intellectual humility and political preference. We had the sample selected to be equal numbers of Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. Then they read a scenario about a politician who changed his view on an issue. He said there's a politician, uh, he once believed a certain thing about the environment and now the re-election's coming up, he, he says he's completely changed his mind. They're not told what the issue is or what direction his position was, only he had changed his mind. And it said, well people said, why do you change your mind? He said, well in the last few years I've learned more about this issue and I realized I was wrong. 
But then it also pointed out that his opponent says, no, he's just flip-flopping to get elected. So the question is, would you vote for this person, and do you think he's flip-flopping? First, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents did not differ in intellectual humility, and I will purposely put a highly non-significant P there to show you it's not like there was some moderate trend. They really didn't differ, just as they didn't differ in religiosity, which I think is a positive feature of the scale. Would you vote for him? Among Democrats and Independents, intellectual humility did not moderate their likelihood of voting for the candidate, but it did for the Republicans. Low intellectual humility Republicans were significantly less likely to vote for him, but the high intellectual humility Republicans were no different in their likelihood of voting for him. I think what's going on there is there's plenty of research in political science suggesting that when studies of what do people want out of a political candidate. Republicans want somebody who's steadfast, who's unchangeable. They want them to declare a position and stick to it. And if somebody has changed, not only are they, per are they perceived wishy as wishy-washy by, by conservatives, but there's this not unreasonable supposition, hey, you were wrong once. How do we know you're right now? You know, you've changed your mind. I want somebody to be right the first time and stick with it. The low intellectual humility Republicans, so that, I think that was their mentality. They just have a, an aversion to people who change. But a highly intellectually humble Republican thinks to themselves, hey, I get new information, I change, I'll give the guy a break, maybe he really changed for good reasons and he's just not flip-flopping. Is he flip-flopping? Again, Democrats and independents, doesn't matter how intellectually humble they are, Low intellectually humble Republicans say, well, yeah, he looks like he's flip-flopping. High intellectually humble Republicans, these three points don't differ from each other. And it appears that you know, they accept the fact that the attitude change was well found. And finally, I'm real excited about these data. What we were thinking is that if intellectual humility is really an important thing, and if this scale is measuring it, it ought to show up not just in people's judgments of information and other individuals, it ought to show up in their social behavior, including in their closest relationships. So we got 74 heterosexual couples to come in. We measured the intellectual humility of both partners, which allowed us to do two things. The most straightforward, how does the intellectual humility of each individual relate to their ratings of the relationship, of their partner, of how they argue, and what their disagreements are about? But more interesting to me, to sort of see whether this is really a potent influence on people's social behavior, can we find that one partner's intellectual humility can be reflected in the reactions of the partner, as if the partner is picking up on that in one way, in one direction or another? So if we look at relationship satisfaction, standard relationship satisfaction scale, how satisfied are you with your relationship? Men's satisfaction with their relationship was predicted by their own intellectual humility. But more impressively, women's satisfaction was predicted by their partner's intellectual humility. Women in relationships with more intellectually arrogant men said they were less satisfied with the relationship. Overall, how well did you get along as a couple? Men's ratings were predicted by their own intellectual humility intellectually humble men said, hey, we get along better, and the women agreed. Women's ratings of how well they get along were predicted by not her intellectual humility at all, but by her partner's intellectual humility. How much do you love your partner? Men's love for their partner was predicted by their own intellectual humility. Women, you don't want to get involved with a low intellectually humble man. It's actually going to account for 4% of the variance in how much he loves you. We, we gave them a list of 11 common topics that couples disagree about and asked them, how much do you disagree about these things as a couple? Men's intellectual humility predicted how often they said that the couple disagreed about friends, and money, religion, amount of time spent together. Women's intellectual humility predicted how often the men said the couple disagreed about communication and household management issues. I found it kind of interesting, these are two things that are sort of stereotypically things that women bug men about. Hey, we're not talking about stuff enough, you know, don't talk to me. Hey, you need to help me clean up the place. We look at women's ratings of disagreements, 
First, the women's intellectual humility did not predict how often they said that the couple disagreed. But the men's intellectual humility predicted how often the women said the couple disagreed about household management, friends, money, and solving problems. And one thing you can see here is that the men's intellectual humility seems to be, seems to have more power. It seems to have more implications than the women's intellectual humility scores. I think the reason for that, we have, uh, have data in, that, in this data set showing that for men, low intellectual humility correlates significantly with argumentativeness. Intellectual humility does not correlate with argumentativeness for women. So it's as if intellectually arrogant men are more prone to argue about these things openly. Intellectually arrogant women, I think they're just happy for the guy to be an idiot and they think, well, yeah, I'll go do your own thing, but I'm not necessarily going to beat you to death with this particular, with this particular disagreement. So that, that's my best explanation of that. A couple of miscellaneous findings. When the man was high in intellectual humility, both members of the couple rated each other as more intelligent and well-informed. So an intellectually humble man thinks that his partner is more intelligent. Intellectually arrogant man thinks she's an idiot because she doesn't agree with all of his nonsense, I guess. And women who are in a relationship with an intellectually humble man sees him as more intelligent and well-informed. And we found a couple of instances in which people were somewhat projecting in the sense that it looks like their own level of intellectual humility was affecting their partner's behavior, but they were making the attribution that it was really their partner and their personality. They didn't realize the degree to which their own intellectual humility was influencing the partner. So high intellectually humble women said that their partners were more agreeable and less selfish. Well, what it looks like, though, is that a woman who's high in intellectual humility behaves in ways that lead their partner to behave in a more agreeable and less selfish way. And by the same token, high intellectually humble men rated their partners as, as less stubborn and more flexible. I don't, my partner's not stubborn. Well, she's not stubborn because you're high in intellectual humility and you're not pushing her into a corner. There are a lot more analyses to be done. I'm really interested in, if each of these effects is just looking at the scores of one individual. The combinations, because that low, low, low intellectual humility for both people combination is probably somewhat toxic. And I just took a real quick look at this and found one, one thing I'll show you. Okay, so here now we're looking at women being low versus high. Here's low men and high men. Women are asked, when you argue, how often does your partner act as if he's 100% right? And men in the double low couples might be behaving in particularly intellectually arrogant ways because not only is he low in intellectual humility, but he's arguing with a woman who's low and she's not going to give in. And so it just has one of these spirals where, yeah, he gets more and more carried away acting like he's 100% right. So that's a whirlwind with the general scale where was, we're very pleased to see that this is something that apparently manifests in behavior to the extent it can influence a per person's romantic partner's reaction to the individual. But that's only half the story. That's the general intellectual humility part. And now we're going to go to specific intellectual humility. Well, you've seen that the general measure allows us to make predictions about and to explain findings in domains. So here you saw the early on the religion domain, followed by the political domain, and then the relationship domain. And that's good. The effect sizes aren't large. But we had assumptions from early on that even though we wanted a measure that would serve us in that way, that we had some sense in which all beliefs are not created equal, even within an individual. Right, that there may be, that I may generally be an individual who is high in intellectual humility. However, there are certain beliefs that I'm unwilling to budge on. And when you go there, then the next question is, well, what are the qualities of those beliefs? So this opened for us a whole new avenue of investigation to see if, one, we could in fact demonstrate some inconsistency perhaps across beliefs within individuals. And if so, if we could account for that variability with certain characteristics either of the person or the qualities of, of the belief. And we held open the possibility that, in fact, these lower order beliefs really are just an alternative way to get at general. So a hypothesis somewhat different from mine is that general is just as a trait, 
is just reflected across one's beliefs and that if you, me if you measure an array of beliefs and you look for the commonality across them, what will emerge is general intellectual humility. So the null hypothesis, and many personality theorists would take that point of view, we had a somewhat different view, and you'll see uh, how that plays out as I show you the data. So the, we, we needed to begin with refinement of the definition, because the definition that Mark gave you works very well in the general case, doesn't necessarily uh, point specifically to uh, domains. So we made minor adjustments. I say minor in one sense. They're minor in the sense that the same three general aspects are represented. It varies in a rather substantial way, however, in that rather than referring to a characteristic of the person, it refers to a characteristic of a given belief that's held by that person. The assumption being the manner in which I hold one belief may in fact be different from the manner in which I hold a different belief. Or not. Again, that's hypothesis to be tested. <coughs> so from that point on, the definition looks just like the general definition that I recognize that my position on this given belief may in fact be fallible. Furthermore, I'm appropriately attentive, attentive with regard to that belief to limitations of the evidentiary basis and my own limitations in obtaining and evaluating new evidence with reference to that, uh, to that domain. So the challenge then, we're back to square one in one sense, that is we don't really see ways to modify the general measure. We need another measure now. Right? And we need a measure that has some very interesting properties because what we don't want is a measure, we don't want to have a measure for each possible domain in which one might look at intellectual humility, right? We, there would be two problems with that. One is it would be very many measures that would be very specific and perhaps vary across, across even investigators studying the same, uh, of the same issue. And furthermore, in fact, it, they may not be comparable in the degree to which they represent this definition. So that, in fact, is the key criterion here, that we, with, equi with an equivalent degree of precision, we reflect this definition in the measure regardless of the particular position or domain on which you're focusing. So we know we're comparing apples to apples when we compare uh, the manner in which you hold a view for one belief versus another. So just underlying this, I'll note, and we'll come back to this as I get to the data, the possibility that specific IH is really a function of at least three things. And in the ideal case, we could build an equation, and we could partition variance in one's uh, IH with regard to a specific issue along three, uh, three dimensions. One is their general intellectual humility. And one hypothesis, again, is that that's the lion's share that the manner in which I hold any position is by and large a reflection of my general tendency to be high or low in IH. But possibly there are other things involved as well, right? It may, in fact, also be a function of where I stand on the issue. And in fact, I'll show you data that very much bear on this one. And then finally, it may have something to do with the basis for holding the position I hold, right? Regardless of where I stand on the issue, what, what evidence, what is the evidentiary basis, and is it possible that that, in fact, has, comes to bear on how intellectually humble I am or not with regard to a specific belief? So again, we had certain criteria for a new measure. We needed it, again, to be brief. And you'll see that, in fact, in this case, we actually wanted a version that would be very brief, because when you go to the topic level, then you begin to realize research opportunities that have to do with inserting a very brief measure into uh, political surveys, sociological surveys. In other words, the idea would be to get this on the radar of people who are trying to understand why people vote the way they vote, uh, why it's difficult to change their view of certain social issues and the like. So we had an instrumental concern there of something that would be very brief, at least a version, but it would, even in its brevity, it would still reflect all aspects of the definition that it would be worded in such a way that it could work for any topic or domain that might be of interest to you. And that not only in the wording level, but in the way it behaves psychometrically, that you, it would operate well and equivalently well, regardless of the position uh, that you happen to be focused on. So a rather tall order, actually. We weren't sure we could pull this, uh, we could pull this off. The very specific considerations you run into in trying to validate this kind of measure Right? For one, you really need to sample an array of issues. 
So any analyses you do get multiplied by the number of issues you decide to consider uh, in a given study. Furthermore, at the validation level, now we're not interested in how it correlates necessarily with personality variables or trait things like need for cognition and openness to experience and these things, but more with, uh, with behavior and how they correlate with one another. So you'll see then the evidence that we bring to bear on the use of this measure is rather different from it, the, the information we brought to bear on the general one. So here, in fact, is the measure. So again, there were three components, and they alternate through the items, fallibility and evidentiary, limitations of evidentiary basis, uh, and then um, limitations in considering uh, new uh, evidence. And there are three that we identified that form a brief measure. So some portion of what I'll show you involves all nine items and the, the sort of psychometric integrity of the nine. And again, hoping that it holds up equally well regardless of what you put in the blank. And I would invite you to experiment with your favorite topic or issue and ask, could you, would it make sense if you put it in, in the blank? And then this brief version uh, as well. So when we're thinking about topics, this itself raises a set of issues worth considering. And that has to do with how broad or narrow those might be and the extent to which, as a, as a function of how broad or narrow, that three-part equation would vary in which component is most important. And we had this notion at the highest level, say, my, general IH, my specific IH with reference to political issues in general, that might be pretty close to general IH. However, if you ask me specifically about a, a given political issue, then in fact, it may be things having to do more with my specific position and the reason I hold that position. So we identify three levels of specificity for this sort of program of research. One is what we call the domain level, and you'll see here are the two that we've talked about so far. There are others, and you can think of any number that you might put in there. We've been very careful not to get hung up on these sort of heavy uh, the three that everybody focuses on, with the assumption being that people have ideas and notions about many things. And in fact, within the context of a relationship, it may be these kinds of things that really uh, are at play in terms of satisfaction. You can imagine then within domain any number of topics you might focus on. And here are some actually that I'll cover today. So within the political domain and the NSA things that have been going on about how much the government knows about us, you might argue there's, a, there's an issue there. There's a particular topic within that domain space that might be of interest. And within that, you can think of various uh, things I'll talk about shortly. But within education, you can think about curriculum, for example. Within parenting, you can, th you can think about information about how you take care of your children when they're young. So any of these domains, then, we can think about topics within the domain. And then going down now sort of one level deeper, and really the, the level at which we do much of the work. That is, you can think with any, within any topic within a domain, you can think about any number of specific issues that you might focus on. And here's where you begin to believe we may begin be pulling away from general IH toward a more specific sense of the manner in which I hold my position with reference to these specific things. So if you sort of line this up, and this is giving you a sense of some of the ones that I'll present to you, here, for instance, is this notion of how a topic is nested in a domain and a, an issue within a topic. Uh, I only show you these three to show you the following thing. It looks very clean when I put it up this way, but it turns out that it really isn't, right? I mean, some people would think, for instance, of, say, homeschooling and issues having to do with how I parent my children as having to do with curriculum. And of course, you can moralize any of these things, right? And people sometimes do. And we, we find pretty good evidence, in fact, of people proving us wrong when we position certain things in a given domain. Certainly, religion and politics, there are any number of issues that move around there. Ten minutes. All right, let me finish up real quickly here. High reliability with all these. Uh, notice this is for. Uh, this is for the long version, this is for the short version, no sacrifice in reliability, very close to what it is for general. Uh, beautiful measurement equivalents, we've now done it across something like 23 domains and it holds up equivalently well. Um, I just want to show you very briefly, and I'm going to go ahead and skip to this correlation matrix. The one interesting exercise is to correlate people's IH on these specific things, and here we have uh, uh, all in all, there are 15 of them. There are four domains, and within each 
within each domain there's a topic and an issue. And we've had a hypothesis that as that correlation with general should go down as you get more specific. For one, you can see that it's fairly modest, despite the fact the very same dimensions are being represented when it's a topic level. In any case, if you go down the way, you can see our hypothesis is only modestly satisfied. The point is, however, if you predict general IH from every one of these things, you only get a multiple R of about 0.47 suggesting there's a lot of variance in people's IH with reference to specific issues that reflects more than just their general uh, IH. Not time to say much about this other than this was our approach to getting at the basis for people's beliefs. Uh, in our particular sample, that column to the right represents variance. Everybody claimed that their, all of their views were based on careful reasoning. Nobody was willing to concede that it might have something to do with uh, with religious teachings. Finally, I'll close with noting one thing that we find if you're interested in the relationship between my position on an issue and my IH with regard to that issue and you just do a correlation, much of the time you'll miss it. That, for example, is a perfectly flat line, right? My religious beliefs, where I stand on them and my religious IH are utterly uncorrelated at the linear level. However, if you consider that it might be curvilinear, it turns out, and I'll just show you an array of these graphs because we've now replicated across many domains and dimensions, it really is a beautiful curve so that you get lower IH as you go toward either extreme of one's position on an issue. And the lines aren't quite as dramatic here, but you can see. So the common core is the only one we don't find it on. And I'll stop with that. Thank you. Perhaps you're getting that. I think it's a clearer exposition of what I had been thinking about than I am. 
<laughs> so yes, no, I, I think that's in line with the fact that intellectually humble people prefer not to feel like things are one-sided yeah. and things are being shoved down their throat because yes. they have a balanced view of things, which is what humility is about, and they prefer one side or the other. But they also recognize anybody who's trying to shove this one view down their throat is probably wrong. Regardless of which side is yeah. happening, but it, it, we're, we're looking at like media usage and, and it, it turns out that we're, we're not exactly looking at the same construct you are, but a related construct. And, it's people don't really want to listen to like, uh, if you're a liberal, you don't want to go listen to Rush Limbaugh necessarily either. If you're uh, if you're high on humility or some related construct, you know, you, you really want to see a balanced presentation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, two quick thoughts. One, um, I had actually a very similar uh, thought on the gender difference in that um, in studies on general humility, I've actually had some gender difference with women being reporting and being rated by the people. Also, going back to that, uh, the, the potential for projecting onto your romantic partner, I was thinking maybe possibly it could be reversed, and the people who are intellectually humble might be better at picking partners. Uh, and then <laughs> they, on, like, the other person might genuinely be more um, humble. So, so really, did, did you see the correlation between? Partners? Yes, I looked at that. Yeah, there is no correlation between intellectual humility scores and two members. Huh. There's no sort of mating in an evolutionary <laughs> sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was my first book too. Right. Right. That's right on target. It's not there. Uh, do you know? Uh, I have a personal interest in this question. Is there a much in the um, discrepancy between uh, partners in terms of their being uh, satisfaction? I ran again. These are brand new data. I did create some discrepancy scores, but I didn't analyze it. Right out of time before I came. But yes, no. I think that ought to show you something. Yeah. Like, yeah. You mentioned the correlation. Okay, correlates with agreeableness, that small point one five. The other three are not significant. Uh, yeah. Uh, you talk about the virtue of humility as a trait. In all of this analysis, uh, you measure the common parts, right? So, so we love, or well, maybe we do have some results uh, over time. But if you measure the common parts, it could be potentially that people are in some intellectually humble state, so they answer, so it is kind of. Yeah, it's entirely possible. We need to get test retest reliability for this. You're absolutely correct. The way the items are worded, they are sort of describing how often do you do these things, and so they're reporting on their more general tendency, which you're absolutely right to do test retest reliability. Um, according with the gender questions that I asked earlier, um, do you think that there will be a shift in the future uh, when it comes to women and men? I ask this because how women might have grown up from the, within the current adult population, we're taught to be more humble and to kind of be subservient in a way so that they can seem more pleasing to other people. An issue we have wrestled with is, I mean, this is sort of trying to get at people's way of processing information. What they show about it publicly self-presentation or behavior is sort of a different thing. So I think men and women differ a great deal in terms of their public modesty and intellectual humility. I mean, that men being argumentative, I think, supports that. So I'm not certain that men and women right now differ on the internal aspect of, internal, of intellectual humility, but they do differ on the external ones. So over time, if you're asking a question about changes in socialization over the time, I mean, there's a lot of instances where men and women are coming <coughs> together in their social behaviors in response to things. So I don't think so. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that at least behaviorally that you see more similarity in the future. And I think at the issue level, I, I, I know you would find differences because we do. Or, and what it comes to mind most clearly now across three studies, women are less intellectually humble with reference to the abortion issue uh, than men, which is not surprising. And I suspect you can see that across other issues. One more question. I, could ask you. I have a question about the non intrusive way of, of looking at this. And I was, I was thinking that. How, how, what about the, the normativity, the belief 
I get sad is that we have a study in which we looked at false consensus. Yeah. The classic false consensus effect. We expected you would be more likely to see that in low IH yeah. people, specifically with reference to given yeah. uh, attitudes. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't, don't see it. <laughs> but it's consistent with this idea. Yeah. Right? A reminder that, that you wanted to, uh, to take a tour of the casino at 4.15, you should be lobby or wherever um, at 415 there's a brief tour of the casino and you can still get back in your line of reception. Uh, otherwise let's thank our uh, speaker.